Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning. I know that people are entering the room. Some of you are very timely. Thank you for being on time. I'll just uh, natter away for a couple of minutes to allow more people to finish their coffees and come into the room. I, I can see footsteps approaching quite quickly now, so if I keep talking, I think uh, people outside will realize we're going to start. Thank you so much for those joining us online. It's really wonderful to have your presence. Hopefully you can see that there will be an opportunity through the chat to ask questions to the panelists later on through the course of the next three days. Um, it's a, a great pleasure to be your host again. Uh, it feels like old friends now looking at some of you and, uh, and having chats and seeing how this whole Space Resources community is developing. Thank you so much. Welcome, Minister. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Fabulous to have you all here with us in Luxembourg. So we're here for yet another Space Resources Week. If you want to tweet about it, put any information on LinkedIn, etc., the hashtag is Space Res Week 24. There's quite a number of them now. And uh, welcome, welcome. If you could kindly take a seat as soon as possible, that would be fabulous. Hi, um, Tommy. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> Uh, some of the microphones are on in the room as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being on time. We're going to try to start on time a little later to start the day today than in previous um, episodes of Space Res Week, which I think is fabulous. I know some people arrived yesterday in Luxembourg. Welcome to those of you who have come to Luxembourg. I know some flights were delayed because of the blustery conditions, but you made it anyhow. Uh, so from far and wide, welcome to Luxembourg, where we'll spend the next three days having lots of in-depth discussions, some keynote speeches, and some very interesting panel discussions. So the theme for this Space Resources Week 2024 is shaping global priorities and coordinating efforts to advance space resource utilization towards cleaner space activities beyond exploration. As we have all seen anybody involved in this community over just recent years, it really is a burgeoning economy, it's a burgeoning community, and I would add a very friendly one at that. We have, as you will note on the program, parallel sessions today through the course of the afternoon, hosted by Dovile this afternoon on law and regulation. Uh, that will be in minus two in this uh, building, minus two, the delegates room. Tomorrow, uh, we have the UNOSA expert meeting that's happening uniquely and in parallel. And we also have, of course, a poster session this evening. You can already vote. You can just scan on your badge on the QR code and you can vote there. Many thanks, as always, to the event partners. I know Catherine Hadler will speak more about them. But to formally open this event, and I must say, we are so grateful to have about 520 of you here in the room, about 600 hopefully joining online. You are all so welcome. And to open, please welcome the Minister of the Economy here in Luxembourg, Lex Dulles. also online. It is a great honor for me to welcome nearly 600 persons on site and 600 people online from all over the world for the sixth edition of the Space Resources Week. We are lucky to have more than 105 speakers who will join us for the key institutions and we are very delighted that we have the ESA, NASA as well as the German astronaut and materialist scientist Matthias Maurer and the director of the UNOSA United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, Arti Hola Maini. Your presence here today, be it online or here in this room, means a lot for Luxembourg 
and our space community as well as for me too. It shows how much the international attention around space resources utilization has grown over the last years. This year is also special. Tomorrow will be held also here in Eckel the UNOSA expert meeting co-hosted with Belgium. The UNOSA expert meeting is part of the working group on legal aspects of space resources activities of the COPUOS, the Committee of the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space of the United Nations. The UNOSA expert meeting serves as a opportunity to collect pre uh, preliminary inputs for consideration at the International Conference in Vienna in 2024. It will enable open, inclusive conversations that will help shaping the international framework of space resources activities. A responsible and sustainable exploration and utilization of resources is essential and the UNOSA expert meeting is paving the way in that context. So it is a real honor that this meeting is being held here in Luxembourg. Dear guests, the Luxembourg Initiative SpaceResources.lu launched in 2016 is particularly relevant to these issues of sustainability, circularity, and resource management. It was a, a forward-looking initiative that led the creation of ESRIC, the European Space Resource Innovation Center, and it is now key to the whole industry and shows the country's commitment to the sector. Indeed, the topic of space resources is now high on the agenda of more countries and agencies. The Space Resources.lu initiative also helped to position Luxembourg as a pioneer in the exploration and utilization of space resources. And since then, the commercial sector has also grown rapidly. In Luxembourg, the company iSpace, which you can see outside this room, was one of the first driven to the Grand Duchy thanks to the Space Resources.lu initiative. And we can be very proud of their presence in Luxembourg. When we know that they will launch in 2024 their second mission to the moon and uh, that a rover made in Luxembourg will be on board. The European Space Resources Innovation Center plays a key role in achieving the objectives of the spaceresources.lu initiative. The center keeps growing since its creation in 2020. It is unique in its positioning, the only center worldwide focusing only on space resources. With only three years since the creation of ESRIC, I am happy to see that the community keeps growing. ESRIC is clearly helping to establish a strong international space resources ecosystem. Let me say a few words about the support program for startups that was set up by ESRIC. We are already launching the fifth thematic call of this startup support program, which fosters the development of young companies focused on space resources. We can be proud of this success. During the Space Resources Week, you will get to know the five early stage ventures that be, will be pre-incubated in the context of the fourth round of this program. This year's conference makes a focus on the role space resources can have for more sustainable space activities. It emphasizes the importance of setting global priorities and coordinating efforts at an international level. In this context, the importance of such events is even more obvious. Building a strong community is paving the way towards even more collaborations and a stronger impact of space resources for space and for Earth. Before concluding my speech I am, uh, and leaving the floor to Mr. Aschbacher, let me thank the organizers, namely ESRIC, ESA, LSA, and LIST, 
Special thanks to our Belgium friends too for the organization of the UNOSA meeting. I also would like to confirm today that the space sector remains a national priority for the Luxembourg government. We are committed to pursuing an ambitious investment and industrial policy for this special sector. Luxembourg wants to remain a key player, particularly in the space resources sector, through which we have many international collaborations. Your presence here today is the testimony of this initiative. I wish you all fruitful exchange and a great time in Luxembourg over the next days. As the minister also responsible for tourism, I can also confirm that uh, here are plenty of magnificent places to discover in our little but very nice country. I hope you will enjoy your stay. Thank you very much. Minister, Minister one more question. Um, since you're also Minister for Tourism, <laughs> Um, I had a question from a guest arriving from Italy yesterday. He wanted to know what speciality to eat at a restaurant here. Uh, we have very good Jutmatgarde Bonen. It's uh, a meat with uh, uh, special, uh, special flavor. So I think you can discover here in Luxembourg, we have, this, uh, we have so many cultural uh, differences. So I think we have restaurants uh, for every taste. I felt a little bit... Uh, <laughs> scared uh, advising an Italian on what to eat, but uh, there we go. Thank you. I'm glad you did it. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. As Minister Dellis just alluded to there, we now have uh, a talk from Josef Aschbacher, who is the Director General of ESA, and he's joining us online. So, good morning everyone and thank you for having me uh, uh, online on this uh, on this opening uh, as minister Lex Dallas was just saying uh, there's so much at stake and uh, I really I'm re really glad to to join you from here as you as you see I'm sitting in my office in Paris unfortunately I'm not enjoying the touristic uh, beauties of, of Luxembourg and uh, I, I'm not with you at the conference center I've seen you have a a wonderful setup there. Uh, I would love to be there. I'm usually uh, live uh, in person at the uh, European Space Resources Week, but uh, this time I, I have to do it from my offices uh, because I have ESA Council uh, today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and uh, unfortunately the logistics uh, are not allowing me to be with you. But still, um, you have all my good spirits and my good wishes from uh, coming here from Paris. So this is the sixth edition of the uh, European Space Resources Week, as uh, Minister Dallas was just saying. It's a very established format. Uh, it is aligning scientific and commercial needs and capabilities, and uh, it helps us to develop a sustainable space resources infrastructure. And I really would like to, to say how grateful we are to Luxembourg and uh, the organizers of this conference to, to make this happen. And uh, now, since a couple of years, you, you really have set uh, the priorities on space resources uh, worldwide. The space resources community has grown significantly over the last uh, years. Um, it is interested both in scientific endeavors, uh, technological solutions uh, for the required complex infrastructures, but also, on the other hand, uh, to create new business models uh, along the value chain of uh, space resources, and this is equally important. This year's theme, as the minister has already outlined, is uh, shaping global priorities and coordinating efforts to advance space resources uh, utilization towards a cleaner space activities beyond exploration. And this is really, as the title already indicates, the priority for all of us, uh, and of course here at the conference in Luxembourg being discussed. Let me say a couple of words on exploration. Exploration is very high on the political agenda of ESA, but also worldwide. Uh, on the ESA side or in Europe, we have published last year uh, a report called Revolution Space. Uh, many of you have read it very carefully. And this was really uh, a milestone in, uh, in defining and in discussing with the member states and with the community what needs to be done, where Europe uh, needs to position itself in the global context, which uh, moves very fast, and what we can do and what we shall do in Europe. And I'm discussing this with my member states uh, uh, quite intensely. We also had a very successful 
uh, Sevilla Space Summit uh, just a few months ago, where competition for European Space Cargo Return Service was one of the elements that was decided by ministers and therefore really a very concrete step of how we uh, increase and uh, support exploration. And uh, we have uh, a ministerial conference coming next year. We are defining with the member states a strategy 2040 and exploration is a priority uh, and I'm discussing it right now uh, with the member states. In fact, uh, this week uh, uh, when we have the ESA Council, this will be one of the topics of discussion. But no exploration will happen without efficient utilization of space resources. It is critical for enabling sustained uh, exploration of the Moon and uh, of Mars. So how can we utilize uh, space re resources? First of all, it minimizes the logistic resupply from Earth, and on the other hand, it reduces transport cost uh, to the place where uh, space exploration is conducted, and therefore also indirectly or directly reducing the carbon footprint. Sustainability, as you all know, becomes more and more also a guiding principle of space exploration. But there's also a very important link to commercialization, um, and uh, this is really the focus also of the activities you are doing at the Spa European Space Resources Week uh, this week, uh, focusing on commercialization. What is ESA doing? Commercialization, as you know, is one of the priorities of uh, ESA Agenda 2025. It is uh, a topic of the Space Council uh, 2024 in May uh, this year, where more competitive European industry uh, will, or more competition and uh, more competitive European industry will be discussed where we stress the importance of space uh, for many other policy domains and economic domains. In ESA, we have various programs uh, dealing with commercialization and uh, they are supporting business and innovation. Let me just name a couple of them, but uh, many of you know them because you are participating in those. For example, the ESA Business Incubation Centers. This is the world's largest business incubation center for space. Uh, we have programs like Scale Up, uh, Boost, uh, Bus, uh, Incubed, and many others that are supporting disruptive innovation in uh, space and uh, sp including uh, resources. We have the Fee Labs, uh, which is a new concept introduced at the last ministerial and now being built up across several member states and within ESA. We have technology brokers. And we have the Investors Network, which also uh, favors and uh, strengthens uh, commercialization. Let me say a word on the Space Resources Accelerator. It is uh, supported by ESA and uh, Business in Space Growth Network, uh, which is conceptualized uh, by ESRIC. Uh, we have just heard the minister uh, speaking about ESRIC uh, in Luxembourg. And also, it is... Uh, dedicated to scale-ups uh, uh, with the capacity to develop applications for the emerging lunar economy. The use of space resources has two dimensions, uh, of course, the demand side and the supply side. On the demand side, uh, we are supporting the definition, development, and delivery of future exploration missions, which are making use of space resources for refueling, life support, maintenance, repair, and construction. And on the supply side, uh, we are supporting the development of services enabled by the exploitation of space resources, for example, related to uh, production of fuel and uh, metal and the associated value chain of, uh, of applications. ESA is holding various roles in, in this context. Uh, uh, some of them are the following. First, uh, we are pushing the to develop uh, space resources enabled applications, uh, for example, by creating first in-space markets, and it is connected to the adjacent markets uh, such as in-space manufacturing and refuel. But ESA, ESA also acts as an enabler for the creation of future industrial operators, uh, which uh, may lead to the establishment of commercial partnerships uh, with selected operators where ESA will act as a, as a customer, as an anchor customer of, of services. ESA has started to systematically invest in space resources related to research and development uh, since uh, 2016. There's a very important role of the Grand Duchy of uh, Luxembourg. Uh, we have signed a memor memorandum of uh, cooperation in 2019 
Uh, we have established uh, the European Space Resources Innovation Center in Luxembourg, together, of course, with Luxembourg, but also with our support of ESA in 2020. And ESRIC really is a, a central asset for Europe. It is the first research, business, and innovation center wholly focused on the utilization of space resources. It enables technology transfer between space and non-space industries, and it supports collaboration with leading players in the space resources ecosystem worldwide. And the cooperation with Luxembourg uh, between Luxembourg and ESA is really outstanding, and I'd like to really use the occasion to thank uh, the Grand Duchy of uh, Luxembourg and the minister in particular for all the strong support uh, uh, Luxembourg has been giving over many years. And they are mostly in four domains where this strong support is, uh, is, is visible, on research and development activities, uh, on incubation of and acceleration of startups, on community management and knowledge management, uh, where we're working closely together. And really, the role of Luxembourg in advancing the topic of space resources in Europe has been really, really outstanding and pivotal in order uh, to make all this happen worldwide. And really, thank you uh, for this very strong support you are given, uh, you're giving to space resources and the space community worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, the implementation of in situ resource utilization strategies presents a prime opportunity to redefine the framework of space exploration operations by leveraging resources directly from the space environment, this utilization can lead to a substantial decrease in cost of space missions. This approach not only enhances the economic feasibility of space exploration, but also contributes to the development of more sustainable space activities through reduced dependency on Earth-based supplies. Furthermore, Integrating the circular economy principles into space missions aligns with broader sustainability goals to which ESA certainly very strongly adheres. I'm really determined to seize the opportunity by embracing an ambitious, focused and bold approach. ESA will position European industry at the forefront of an emerging lunar space uh, or in space economy driving innovation and industrial development for a bright and better future. And we have a golden opportunity ahead of us. We have uh, the next ministerial conference, uh, which we are already st starting to prepare. Uh, and uh, this will be a milestone, a very important milestone, where we can uh, fo set focus on, uh, on, uh, on, on uh, space resources. Daniel Neuenschwander, my director for human and robotic exploration, is with you but also several members of my ESA team are with you at, uh, at the ESRC, and uh, they will certainly provide more details and plans of uh, how we prepare and what pre we prepare for the next ministerial conference. And I really can only wish you great success. Thank you for allowing us to be your strong partner in this uh, uh, week, in this uh, European Space Resources Week, and uh, with my best regards uh, from Paris. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yosef, and uh, good luck with all of the meetings in Paris. And certainly, Isa is well represented here in Luxembourg with plenty of colleagues in the room. And we'll hear from Daniel in just a moment. But first up, we welcome to the stage Catherine Hadler, who is the director of ESRIC. Moyen. And welcome to Space Resources Week 2024. On behalf of the organizers, that's ESRIC, the European Space Resources Innovation Center, Luxembourg Space Agency, the European Space Agency, and Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, LIST, I would like to welcome you all to this, the largest annual gathering of the space resources community. It's been wonderful already this morning to see so many familiar faces, uh, and also lots of new faces as well. Over the next three days, we have a packed schedule. So whether you've been in the sector for a while, watching it grow and mature, or whether you are new and this is your first time uh, visiting, then there should be plenty for you to learn from and be inspired by in our packed, uh, packed 
program of talks, posters, panel sessions, pitching sessions, and of course, the exhibition. We are delighted to have so many people on site uh, this year. We've got over 530 people registered to be here at the European Convention Centre Luxembourg. We have over 100 speakers, over 50 posters, so it really is uh, a packed programme. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our 11 sponsors. You can see them there on the screen. I'd like to thank them for their support of this event. On Friday and Saturday, we had the, we had the Space Resources Week professional course. Uh, this course is hosted by the always inspirational Angela Bud Madrid of Colorado School of Mines, uh, plus some guest speakers as well. On this course, we had 45 attendees, which is also a record. And this course really gives a good foundation in all things related to, to science, technology, the customers, uh, all aspects of space resources. So these are the people that should be asking the toughest questions this week, or we may consider taking away uh, the certificates. I know who you are. Uh, anyway, th let's move on. I wanted to talk a little bit about ESRIC. We've already heard from the Minister and from ESA's Director General uh, a bit about ESRIC. So if you don't know uh, everything about ESRIC by the end of this session, then, uh, then you never will. <laughs> ESRIC uh, was formed in late 2020. We are the world's first research and innovation center entirely dedicated to sp space resources. We have a really clear mission. Our mission is to be a world-leading center of excellence in the science, technology, and business of space resources to support human robotic space exploration and for a future in-space economy. We are an initiative of LSA and LIST, and we work with ESA as strategic partner. We have three main areas of activity. We do research. We are developing extensive research capabilities. We support business through our initiatives to support our emerging sector, and we work in our community activities, bringing together people, connecting researchers, entrepreneurs, and ind industry. Our team today is 22 people. We have expertise in planetary geoscience, uh, ge planetary geoscience materials engineering, um, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and commercialization. Our research team itself is 12 people. Uh, but we're growing. We currently have open positions for postdoctoral and experienced researchers, so if you would like to join our wonderful team, please check out those opportunities. We're based about 20 kilometers southwest of here in Belleval, uh, in the area with the beautiful uh, refurbished blast furnaces. And today we have around 20 projects. So our team of 22 currently has about 20 projects, of which 50% are in partnership with or funded by ESA. We do research, so we both do our research, but also we're developing research facilities for use by the community. And in our research activities, we cover the lunar oxygen value chain, but also we're expanding into other areas, and I will talk about this shortly. In our research infrastructure, we have our ground-based support, so this is the dusty thermal vacuum chamber and the ground-based pilot plant. We have tech demonstrators. These are procured by ESA, so oxygen from regolith uh, demonstrators. In our business support activities, we run the Startup Support Program. We've already heard about this. Uh, the Startup program, Support Program is now fully established. It's the world's first incubator program dedicated entirely to space resources. We recently had the pitching for the third uh, incubator, um, incubated startup. And we, will, um, we also very recently had the, the pitching session for the fourth round of startups that will go into the 12-week re remote pre-incubation phase. You can find out more about this from Larry Kuchko. Uh, he will be talking this afternoon, and also there's the pitching session on Wednesday. We recently launched the de design phase of our Space Resources Accelerator, and as we heard already, this is really about scale-ups. And here we're interested in matching and co-funding ESA funds with, uh, with other sources of funds to really accelerate some space resources projects. You can hear all about this from Alex Godlewski on Wednesday. In terms of our community activities, we have this, Space Resources Week. Uh, but also, it should be said, that the team do a huge amount of public engagement and outreach. We also, in 2021-22, had the ESA and ESRIC Challenge, and I will talk about that more now. 
So you may recall in 2022, we hosted uh, the first Issa and Esric challenge. And this was based on prospecting, testing technologies and strategies for prospecting uh, for lunar resources. We hosted a spectacular final event at Rockhall down in uh, Belleval. And I think one of the, the great things about this was really testing these technologies in, the, in a competitive environment under the conditions that one might expect to find in the moon. A consortium from, uh, from that com challenge are now developing their technologies further under an ESA contract, and that was the prize. You can hear them talking about that uh, later on, I think it's tomorrow. But really what we, what we found really interesting was the, the, the concept of testing technologies in this competitive environment, and the look of exhaustion, I think, on the faces of the team just showed how much uh, this was a challenge. But I'm delighted then to announce the challenge is back so, the next ESA and ESRIC challenge is being launched in 2024. Uh, the theme is excavation and beneficiation. Uh, those of you who know me will know that beneficiation is my subject, so I'm enormously excited about this. Uh, so the theme has been established. There will be prizes from ESA. There will be a prize from, from LSA as well. Uh, and more details will follow in due course. Melchiori Conti will no doubt talk about this more uh, this afternoon. So please watch this space, pun intended, uh, for more details on our next challenge. Let's move from now a little on to the facilities and the research at ESRIG. So we're developing our laboratory facilities. On the right-hand side there, you can see our lab. It seems to get busier every week. Every week, there's more and more equipment in there. In the central zone, the oxygen extraction zone, you may just about be able to make out in the back our hydrogen reduction prototype that was procured by ESA. And that will be joined by three molten salt electrolysis cells, which are currently being manufactured and will be delivered later on this year. In terms of our strategic facilities, we have two projects that are currently in different stages of ESA contracts. So the dusty thermal vacuum chamber, this is being manufactured as we speak by a consortium led by Spartan Space, and we are expecting this to be delivered uh, late 20 or be manufactured by late 2025. The ground-based pilot plant is in a design and scoping study. This is led by a consortium uh, uh, led by Space Application Services. And this pilot plant is based on an end-to-end -end process with molten salt electrolysis at its core that will allow technologies to be tested in a complete system. But what you see is a lot of our visible activities here. We see the business support, we see the uh, research facilities and our community activities. Behind this is a growing body of research activity. So here I've borrowed my favorite uh, picture of a space resources future to illustrate the approach we're taking in our research. We have a growing team uh, of researchers from PhDs onwards doing really genuinely exciting research uh, originally across the value chain, so we have prospecting. We have oxygen and metals from regolith. In addition to our demonstrators, we work with ESA on plasma enhanced, enhanced hydrogen reduction and with ESA and Airbus on looking at the metals produced from molten salt electrolysis. In purification, we work with air liquid uh, and ESA on both water and oxygen purification. But now this is being um, complemented by other topics, and these are supported by the Luxembourg National Research Fund, the FNR, uh, and this is in part funded by the, the, the program, programmatic funding uh, that we have to support the development of research capabilities in sustainable and responsible uses of space resources. So we see topics such as recycling, beneficiation, and dust mitigation included. You can find out more about our research in our talks and in our posters, which will be on display tonight. So, what do we have to look forward to? Well, we have our usual diverse mix of uh, science, technology, business, new concepts, uh, legal and regulatory aspects. The field of space resources is diverse. I'm very fond of telling my students at the University of Lux Luxembourg's Masters in Space Technology and Business that nobody can be an expert in all, uh, in all of the topics of space resources. But what we do have an opportunity to do in forums such as this 
is to discuss, is to be clear about what it is that we're doing, what we need as inputs, and what we provide as outputs so that we can move forward together uh, to, to pursue this activity. And that really sets the theme for this year's conference, and that's to set priorities, coordination, uh, and explore exciting new developments, enabling humanity to go further into space in a cleaner manner. Now, last year, at the end of the talk, I expressed my appreciation of graphs. Uh, and in fact, as uh, in Esric, we do have a graph of the week competition. I do really love a graph. I have a graph for this year. Uh, this is my graph this year, and this is a distribution of on-site participants by, um, by sector. And what's pleasing about this is that we can see that we are equally distributed between research and development activities, industry, agencies, and other organizations. So what we take from this, yes, we're in a new, a new venue, but we are still the same diverse mix of academia, research, industry from startup through to established industry, space agencies, and other organizations. We have the UNISA expert meeting on site as well. So we really have an excellent opportunity to talk, to make new, new connections, so that we can see the realization of the potential of space resources. So thank you. Enjoy the week. Uh, and I look forward to hearing your feedback as well. Thank you so much, Catherine. And we had a little chat about graphs before the morning began. We all like a graph. And she was saying that at ESRIC, they have a weekly graph. So I think that's a fabulous idea. Um, next, we have uh, Daniel Neuenschwander. But just before Daniel comes to the stage, um, I want to encourage you all not to be on your phones or iPads or whatever equipment you have with you. But if you sign in to Space Rise Week, um, you can also click on the session and chat. So certainly for people online, I can see that's already happening. Um, and we will have a panel discussion coming up at 11.30. Um, then you will have to click onto that session. But right now, you can even add some comments and feedback to things you're hearing. If you log in, click on the session, and, uh, and then you will see the chat there. I'm sure you're all far enough intelligent to understand how that works. Daniel Neunschwander, he is the Director of Human and Robotic Exploration at ESA. Please welcome him to the stage. Good morning, Luxembourg. Good morning, Europe. Uh, good morning to international partners. Thank you very much for inviting ESA to this very special Space Resources Week. I have now the pleasure to say a couple of words of uh, what we plan to do and what we do in Europe about space exploration, how we want to bring it forward, including space resources, of course. Our Director General spoke a couple of minutes ago about the ESA 2040 strategy, which is now in the making with our member states. And I'm very happy to report that regarding exploration, the job is done, we delivered, uh, we could finalize uh, a great text uh, with our member states a couple of weeks ago, and we have a goal. We have an ambition, uh, the ambition is bold, an implementation plan will follow, and member states will decide with which pace we'll implement it but at least Europe knows where we want to go. Uh, I will just summarize here a couple of words. We have an ambition. We want to leapfrog is a strong word, but we want at least to play in the first row on some dedicated topics, and let me say it from the beginning. I, sir, you are part of them. And then we need, of course, to have an achievable plan. The pace of implementation, as mentioned, will be uh, decided. But what is clear, it's an incremental approach. Uh, this is very clear. Having said that, what we want to achieve is to uplift science and the socioeconomic benefits. Why is it so important before we go, explore, stay, use, and go to the next destination? We must understand. We must understand what is around us, and this is why this uplifting dimension of science is so important, including uh, the socioeconomic impacts uh, back on Earth, on our spaceship Earth. And we want, it has been said by our Director General, uh, we want to have sustained and sustainable space exploration in 
and from Europe, we want to act as a responsible uh, actor in this international endeavor. And with that, of course, ISRU are also uh, a key topic. We have our four uh, key elements here. The three destination, low Earth orbit, where, as uh, it has been mentioned, we would like to maintain a human presence in, uh, in low Earth orbit and utilize it. For that, we need also to develop transport capabilities. Uh, transport is by far the biggest share of the costs, as you know, but also the related infrastructure, which will be more and more commercially driven, and uh, we develop for that new means. Then, of course, we want to go to the moon, but not to make pictures from the moon or back uh, from Earth, but to stay there in a meaningful way and this is why uh, it is so important that uh, we, we work on space resources, and I will say a couple of words to that in a, in a minute. But for that, you must also have capabilities to go there. I recall that five nations landed on the moon, one commercial company, three of them in the last couple of months, and we, Europe, where stands Europe? So we have a program, it's called Argonaut. We have to deliver this lander as soon as possible because it's so important to be there with your own capabilities to be a valuable and trusted partner. And of course, we have destination Mars. The horizon goal is, of course, to bring humans to Mars. Will not be for tomorrow, but uh, we are working on that. We are working on that with robotic capabilities. Europe is uh, in a good shape in the sense that uh, we have robotic recognized capabilities. We have our Rosalind Franklin mission, which will have a drilling capability, which is absolutely crucial if you think that uh, signs of life are most prominently present at roughly 1.5 meters below the surface of Mars. To have this drilling capability to go down to two meters is absolutely fundamental. And we will grow precision landing capabilities in terms of increased payloads to the Martian surface and ultimately support human operations. And I said four elements because there is a cross-cutting element I want to underline, and this is a human dimension the human exploration, which is uh, the trigger for everything. And I'm very happy that we have also here uh, with us Matthias Maurer from our European Astronaut Corps. Matthias, beyond being known uh, as, of course, uh, an important European, having been on, on board of the International Space Station, is also leading Luna. And I, I mentioned this on purpose because it's a ground analog that we are going to inaugurate this year in September in Cologne which will be uh, a facility to simulate operations on the lunar surface. Uh, 1,000 tons of uh, lunar regolith, which are there on, on this ground, which can be partially frozen. You have dedicated illumination. You have uh, simulated microgravity. That's so important. I want to underline this here, because the link to ESRIC, the link to other capabilities in Europe are so important in order really to achieve this leapfrogging I mentioned. So now I have to speed up a bit. Uh, why is uh, ESRO so important? I think it has been mentioned. Let me just underline that it is an absolutely critical capability for sustainable exploration. It is a dimension of resilience. This has also been mentioned by reducing the dependencies on Earth-based supplies. And last but not least, the potential of reducing costs. Transport has been mentioned before. The, reduction, uh, the potential to reduce the environmental impact CO2 footprint has been mentioned, so, but also the opportunity to increase proper risk management. This should not be uh, forgotten. At the end, we speak about operations. We speak about operations which, at which human lives are at stake, and for that, you have to have a proper risk management. If you have in situ resources which you can use, uh, you can also address risk management. I give you a, a concrete example, the capability of refueling, uh, you, your spacecraft before landing, for example, is an element which we could consider in this time, in this context. What ESA has done since 2019, um, first and above all, supported the creation of ESRIC. And I think uh, I don't need to pitch this anymore. Let me just say that we have a really successful cooperation here. I want to thank the Luxembourg delegation for that. We have a very good cooperation. And I'm happy to announce that we are working right now on the um, elongation of this good agreement. And I'm for, uh, looking forward to be in a situation to sign very soon another five years uh, of great cooperation between Luxembourg and ESA in this domain. It, we have to engage, and we did engage in science-driven 
prospecting missions. Prospect here is an example. It is important. It is important to understand this environment, as mentioned before. It's uh, part of the CLIPS program, Commercial Lunar Payload Services from NASA. Uh, we want to extract oxygen. We want to, have, uh, to measure polar ice from the lunar regolith. We have a mass spectrometer, uh, which measures uh, abundance of uh, water. So we are working on that. But let me make one point. The most important is technology maturation, to show that you have the capability. And I think that Ezric plays here a very important point. The point about the first uh, space resort challenge has been mentioned before. I will not come back on it, but I think it's so important. Looking ahead, of course, what is here on the slide is the longer term perspective. Of course, we want to prepare the future emergence of economic uh, operators. Of course, we want to deliver prospecting missions. And of course, we want to define missions enabled uh, by space resources utilization. But first things first. First things first means technology they're risking. And number two, deploy small pilot plants. I mean, we want to learn concretely from con with concrete results on the job what we can do. And based on that, we'll go the next incremental way. Uh, to just give one example, energy consumption of such a small pilot plant will be a challenge, so let's go through it, let's address it. I have here on the screen 1 minute 22, so I take the challenge to conclude in this time uh, frame. So the near-term uh, focus on lunar regulate utilization. Um, here again, you have our long-term approach, and this is certainly key, we want to act as an enabler, and our DG mentioned it, we want to uh, be a partner and a customer, but I repeat myself, let's prove that we can do it. Let's really uh, go into that, and I think that economic operators will invest if there is a reasonable return of investment, uh, which is at reach. And we have to keep this in mind when we work on the timescales and the implementation plan. And it is the public sector's role and ESA's role in particular to support de-risking these industries who are re ready to leapfrog, who are ready to take risks. We want to do it through five uh, real steps. And let me just check that I'm in time. I am. So there are five steps. First is what Ezric is doing. Second is to support business development by assessing commercial visibility uh, and viability of future ISRU uh, ventures. Third is, and I think it's so important also here on the slide, to identify uh, critical technologies and advanced capabilities. Fourth is to improve and grow, mature an international community where Europe is engaged with its priorities which is goals of sustainability, driving the process. There will be a lot of legal and regulatory discussions. Let's just lead by example, have the Europeans having the flag up and leading also industrial consortia across the world, but with European industries being the spearhead. And with this, we are at point five, and this comes to commercially led techno demonstrator, demonstrators. If we have that, I'm a happy man, and we have brought Europe a step further. Thank you very much, and I hope that you will contribute to inspire our current and next generations. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. I can see that some chat is already beginning on this session, and questions are being answered by people in the room, so it's really nice to continue that collaboration. Um, next up, we have a recorded message from Hiroshi Yamakawa, who is the president of JAXA. Hello, everyone. I'm Hiroshi Yamakawa, JAXA president. First, on behalf of JAXA, I would like to sincerely thank Mr. Mark Serres, CEO of Luxembourg Space Agency, for inviting me to address this important event, the Space Resources Week 2024. It is my honor to be with you today. I understand that this year's theme is shaping global priorities and coordinating efforts to advance space resource utilization towards cleaner space activities beyond exploration. Thus, I would like to start with briefly introducing JAXA's activities 
related to this theme. The Japanese government recognizes that space exploration activities has two major values, the creation of human wisdom and the expansion of the frontiers of human activity. Based on this concept, JAXA is, is engaged in various space exploration missions. One of the latest and the most gratifying accomplishments for JAXA was the successful lunar surface landing by our smart lander for investigating moon, SLIM, in January 2024. Aiming to land within 100 meters of its target, it demonstrated high precision landing technology by landing approximately 55 meters away from the target point. We are proud that Japan has not only become the fifth country in the world to successfully land a probe on the moon, but has also successfully demonstrated pinpoint landing technology that will contribute to the future development of lunar and planetary exploration. Moving from the era of landing where we can land to landing where we want to land, SLIM has also conducted scientific observations of the lunar environment using the multiband spectroscopic camera and the data is contributing to scientific research which will open up new possibilities for space resource utilization. Our Martian Moons Exploration MMX mission is also under development, aiming to launch in Japanese fiscal year 2026. Using technology inherited from the asteroid sample return missions of Hayabusa series, MMX will gather samples from the Martian moon Phobos and analyze them for hydrous minerals, water, and organic matter, thereby contributing to obtain the keys to solving the mystery of planetary formation in the solar system. In addition, MMX will conduct the world's first detailed observation of the surface topography ground information and surface and surrounding environment of Phobos, which is considered to be an important base for future manned Mars exploration, studying its potential for use as a natural space station. Coming back to the keyword of cleaner space activity, JAXA believes that participation of the private sector, international collaboration, and sharing common principles of safety and transparency are the three essential factors for future cleaner space activities. First, we have to say that private companies are making remarkable progress in space exploration activities. One such company is iSpace, a Japanese startup tackling space resources utilization with, a, with an office in Luxembourg. Their mission one, the first attempt at a soft land, lunar landing by a private company, narrowly fell short of a complete success last year. However, they are moving forward with the Mission 2, scheduled to launch as early as the winter of 2024, with plans to collect lunar regolith with a micro-rover that is being developed with joint funding from the Luxembourg Space Agency. We have been inspired by their activities, and we have high expectations for the outcome of iSpace Mission 2. As space exploration activities are diversifying and expanding to the Moon, Mars and beyond, we believe that bringing together the knowledge and funds of various countries and implementing space exploration projects in collaboration with international partners is an effective and extremely important element for achieving the greatest possible results. In addition, we believe that it is also essential to share the principles for creating an environment of safety and transparency among the countries involved and make them the cornerstone of our space exploration activities. The importance of ensuring safety and transparency was also confirmed within the member states at the Artemis Accord signatory meeting held last year at the IAC in Baku. I understand that the expert meeting of the Working Group on Legal Aspects of Space Resource Activities in Copus will be held simultaneously during the Space Resource Week. JAXA will continue to support the discussions in the Space Resources Working Group from a technical perspective. JAXA places importance on the three factors, 
participation of the private sector, international collaboration, and sharing common principles of safety and transparency, and hopes to further develop our space exploration activities on a long-term and sustainable basis. To conclude my message, I would like to thank the European Space Resources Innovation Centre, Luxembourg Space Agency, European Space Agency, and Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology for hosting the sixth Space Resources Week and for leading international discussion on space resources. I am convinced that the Space Resources Week will serve as a venue for fruitful discussions contributing to future space resources exploration activities. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much to Hiroshi there from JAXA. Um, the space rover that he alluded to from iSpace is just outside in that direction, which you can see. And we'll hear from the CEO of iSpace Europe, Julien Lamame, in the next panel. But before that, please welcome Matthias Maurer, who is a material scientist and, of course, an ESA astronaut. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here again in the Space Resource Week in Luxembourg. We heard from the earlier speakers about the value and the importance of the space economy. And the space economy has a lot of actors, and these actors need to know how to work together. So where is the environment, the ecosystem, where these actors can practice before they fly to the moon and later on to Mars? That's what I would like to highlight in the next um, 10 minutes. So one environment where we could practice and where we actually did practice is going to an environment like Lanzarote, which is volcanic and there we train astronauts how to explore the moon. But we also brought scientists there to practice and to see like, okay, how do astronauts operate systems? How do scientists run experiments? And how can we work together? That was hugely successful. The disadvantages um, this is a protected environment. We only get access maximum one week per year. And uh, there's a lot of logistical overhead. So we decided we need to have something that is more permanent available. And that's where Luna comes into play, which is a director for human spaceflight and exploration, Daniel Neunschwander alluded to before. Luna is a new facility that will close a gap, the gap between field testing and testing inside an environment. Luna here, this is a sketch that you might have seen before because uh, I've talked about this facility for quite some time. We have the moon surface inside a hall. And this hall has regolith, it has complete darkness, it has light conditions like on the moon, a very strong sun simulator. We have a gravity offloading system and lots of other features that make it really like a most identical place for the like most identical to the moon but being on earth on the outside we also have habitats so we have the ambition that we can test everything inside the lunar facility that is important for the artemis missions so everything from the moment the eagle has landed until six and a half days that will be the duration of the first artemis missions the eagle leaves again or whatever the name of the eagle will be. So our ambition is that everyone before flying to the moon comes to Cologne. The slide that you saw before was a sketch. This is the reality. This is the lunar hall that's currently being built. And you see, we start operations on the 25th of September 2024. So in six months, today in six months, on the right hand side, you see on the top the hall. It's absolutely dark inside, black, because we want to have light conditions as on the moon. It's difficult to recognize the features. That's why I added a photo of an earlier stage when we still had no walls. Luna has a surface area of roughly 700 square meters. Um, it has a regular test bed filled with 1,000 tons of regolith. And um, we have 
rough an average um, a height of 60 centimeters regulus, but also a deep floor area of three meters where you can go for prospecting, you can do drilling. We have a dust lab where we can analyze the different aspects related to how can we protect the crew from bringing the dust inside the habitat. That was a huge problem during the Apollo phase. And also where you can test the equipment, make sure that it doesn't fail due to the dust. The main features of Luna will be a reduced gravity. We will have a gravity offloading system, which is highly innovative, and where you can suspend like several actors, not only limited to two or to three, as uh, competitors have. And then we can practice working in moon gravity, but we can also adjust it to mass gravity and also use this. We have illumination on the moon, the sun is so bright that if you have the shadow in front of you and you drop your tools there, you wouldn't find it anymore. It's so pitch black. That's a huge difference to the shadow here down on, on, on planet Earth. And when we fly to the poles, the sun will be very low on the horizon and we have long shadows and that will impact how we operate, how we like move on the moon and also the systems that we will bring along. And all this we can test inside Luna. Luna will be embedded in the, in the ground system network that is connecting the ISS with uh, the different control centers to Houston Mission Control, Columbus Control Mission, uh, Mission Control. And Luna will be a part of this network. So we can run experiments in Luna, but the control team might be in the US might be in Munich or it might be somewhere else. You might run it from your university, from your company. <clears throat> Luna has a lot of different features. Uh, they are completely listed here. The gravity offloading I mentioned already, the sun simulator, the ground segment. We have real dust, so it is uh, dust that would also contains the fine fraction because we want the stuff to fail in Cologne in Luna and not on the moon. So it will be challenging. We all will hate it um, because it's so dusty and uh, we will need to wear protection when we work inside. But it's, it's for the purpose of like improving our systems, making sure that on the moon we have really hardened and proven technology. We have also the um, uh, kind of the navigation system signals which comes from the satellites, the moonlight, European moonlight um, satellites. We have the simulators inside Luna, so we can also test this equipment. Deep floor area, we will have a ramp, and we have moon geology, which is selected from geologists, and so we can test handheld instruments, we can test rovers, we can test human-machine interaction in uh, prospecting, in uh, like taking samples, the entire procedures. We have astronauts, rovers, we have a medical system that ESA is developing. We have EVA suits, analog suits. Uh, we have crew quarters attached to it. We have the question of how we will provide energy to our station, to our systems, um, where we will live, how we will work inside, how we will like, go from the inside to the outside, the dust. A problematic I already mentioned. We will have Eden Luna, which is a greenhouse system, and the entire surface will be um, fully available with extended reality. So mixed reality, having VR goggles, we can have real hardware there, but we can also use virtual reality to uh, have this mixed combination of real hardware and, and, um, and the simulated environment and the mission control system. Okay, so we have two target groups. One is the NASA Artemis uh, team. So we will be able to run everything from the moment the Eagle has landed until we fly back again. So the outside operations on the moon surface, but also the inside operations. And you as the moon community. Like different teams here have different technology that you are developing. You want to test it and you want to know like how does your equipment interact with other people's equipment. And Luna is the place to be. So we invite you to come to Cologne 
It's free to use, that's the huge benefit of it, so come. And uh, everything works in a picnic manner. So everybody contributes and together we will learn a lot and advance in high speed. Lunar utilization, it's an open platform. It has low risk, low logistic overhead compared to the field tests. It is continuously available. And when I say continuously available, it means 365 days a year. And uh, even if you live in a country with a different time zone, we could run or you could run your equipment in Luna remotely. And uh, if something fails in the morning, our teams could set it up again and just make sure that it runs again. It is a fully controlled environment and provides a maximum reproducibility to um, to have the best outcome in the most similar lunar environment available on planet Earth. We can use it for science, we can use it for operations, and we can use it for end-to-end -end mission simulations. And uh, time is running out, so I jump over. We heard already about the uh, Space Resource Challenge, that was a huge success. All the teams that participated in it always report how useful it is to do this stuff in a competition, but also working together, having the exchange. Luna is such a platform that is ideal. So I sincerely hope that we, we will see in the future the next challenges running in Luna, hopefully already next year. And um, yeah, please come to Cologne and uh, make good use of the Lunar facility. Thank you very much. Actually, Matthias, we have uh, two questions online. Uh, Raphael asks, I think you answered it, but he's asking, will Luna be open for the general public? Yes, uh, so it's, um, we have several user groups. So we will have the ops teams, we have the science teams, we have like, uh, industry, startups, we actually got funding with the clear goal to help startups to, uh, to get to the market. And um, we will also have the, open, uh, the, the public to come. Um, we have a visitor room, we have guided tours, and maybe we can also have special events where the public can interact. So one of the ideas that we also have is in the night, if nobody's working, we will have rovers that can be run via internet. And so we will have the kids maybe um, driving rovers inside Luna um, yeah, through the internet. I think that sounds like a lovely idea. In the UK, you can have a sleepover at the Natural History Museum. Perhaps you can have this at Luna one day for the... It'll be a dusty a sleepover. Great, <laughs> a great way to make money, I can tell you. Um, uh, also, Carlos asks, the lunar simulant used, is it the same one throughout, or different geological compositions are they employed? So inside Luna, the huge, um, the 1,000 tons that we have inside the 700 square meters, it's EAC-1, that is a well-known and well-characterized lunar simulant. But inside the, the dust chamber that we have, we can exchange the simulant. And so we will also have more the anorthositic uh, composition. Um, like At least that's foreseen for the beginning. If there's special requests, we can for sure make look into that and, and there's a good chance that we can implement it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you. Now, our next speaker, I'm sure we'll talk about what's going on tomorrow. Please welcome to the stage Arti Hola Maini, who is the director for the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. As usual, the mics are a bit too high for me. <laughs> there you go. Your Excellency, Minister Dellis, uh, esteemed guests, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Luxembourg for once again hosting this important meeting. I'm delighted to address you um, and close the, the opening remarks on behalf of the United Nations. 
We stand at the threshold of a new era in space exploration, as everybody knows. Space may be vast, but as we seek to explore it, it is imperative that we not only seek out new destinations, but that we also enable safe and sustainable pathways to get there. COPUS, the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, is at the heart of these discussions. The innumerable space activities that we are witnessing today are built on the treaties, principles, resolutions, and guidelines that are the outcomes of the international cooperation within the committee. Given the pace at which space activities are accelerating, the role of COPUS couldn't be more important than it is today. COPUS convenes nation states, regardless of their size and regardless of whether or not they are spacefaring nations. And it puts them on an equal footing to collaboratively forge ahead the path on space uh, governance. As well as acting as secretariat to COPUS, UNUSA hosts workshops and international conferences to ensure that conversations, including around space resources, are inclusive and forward thinking. With the new era of lunar exploration being driven by both governments and industry, such events are fundamental to making progress on a framework for cooperation and coordination for lunar and cislunar activities. Recognizing the need for progress, a proposal for a consultative mechanism on lunar activities was well received by the last COPUS Scientific and Technical Subcommittee. That took place back in February this year. The proposal invited the committee to consider working on various aspects of sustainable lunar exploration and settlement, including operational coordination, safety enhancements, protecting the lunar environment, and regulating access to natural resources. The proposal of an action team on lunar activities consultation, known as ATLAC, marks the beginning of a journey to create a dedicated forum where lunar operators can share critical information and coordinate their operations. This initiative aims to enhance safety and preserve the integrity of the lunar environment and its heritage sites, ensuring that the moon remains a domain for all humanity. To support this process, UNUSA is also organizing a UN conference on sustainable lunar activities taking place in Vienna on the 18th of June, to which I warmly invite you to participate. The event will support the multilateral dialogue on lunar governance, involving both governments and non-governmental sectors. The conference aims to better understand commonalities within the different approaches of key actors and identify potential avenues for global coordination. Through focus sessions on coordination, commercial perspectives, and behavioral norms, we hope to bring players closer together on a constructive course for sustainable lunar and activities in line with the principles of the Outer Space Treaty. The conference is a call to action to all spacefaring nations to come together and agree on a framework that respects international treaties and promotes the sustainable use of lunar resources. These initiatives respond to the call to action that has been made by the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, in his policy brief for all humanity, the future of outer space governance. There are so many missions going outside of the Earth's orbit, to the moon and beyond, the potential of which we cannot yet fathom. And that's why the Space Policy Brief invites us to unite to work on a space resources framework ahead of time, so that we do not do to the pristine surface of the moon and other bodies what we have sadly managed to do to Earth. We have intelligently used space technologies, not only to reach faraway destinations, but also to start exploring them in a way that we could not have done many decades ago. We must now be smart about how we move forward. We have a chance to get it right, and we owe it to ourselves and to future generations to do so. The commitment within this community is vital in guiding those discussions and decisions that will shape the management of space resources and activities for the future. Tomorrow, UNUSA will hold its expert meeting on space resource activities as part of the work of its legal subcommittee. I'd like to thank the government of Luxembourg and the government of Belgium for so kindly hosting it.
We hope that this expert meeting, convening over 120 people, will contribute to further the discussions on developing a set of initial recommended principles for space resource activities. The Working Group on Space Resources is yet to define what types of rules and or norms it wants. What is most important at this point, however, is that we do move forward and that we do so collectively, and I believe that we are on that path. In conclusion, the role of COPUS, the United Nations, and of UNUSA, the office that I have the privilege of running, as cornerstones of the international cooperation in space cannot be overstated. The collaborative efforts of these entities and member states through the multilateral process are crucial. Let us remember that today's space economy is built on the fundament of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. It was negotiated between two adversaries at the height of the Cold War. With the challenges of outer space governance that face us now, we are invited to once again show the same grit and determination that was shown then to come together and to commit again to working in the interests of the greater good. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for having the UN with you as well. We have a question from Bernard Huang online. As UNOSA coordinated payload from emerging countries to space, could we think of similar programs to build and bring worldwide payload to the moon? I'm sure that such possibilities will be created by ESA and by other, uh, other partners as well. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing like the brevity of a diplomatic answer. Um, now, we have, shockingly, oh, by the way, uh, we have another um, uh, comment online from Frank Koch, uh, just moving on from Matthias, who says, if you're interested in testing already, uh, we have at Spaceport Ro Rostock, uh, they are already welcoming researchers and industry, and you can find them on site, and you can drop him an email directly at frank.koch, K-O-C-H at P-T-S dot space. So he's opening up the door there as well. Now, we are ahead of time, thanks to the amazing planning of Delia and team. So she's allowing us a 15-minute break before the panel session. So we will start again at 35 minutes past in the room. So 10 to 15-minute break. Thank you. <laughs>